Williams. Shabbat Shalom. Today's going to be slightly different, as you may have gathered. Um, with Passover approaching, and with uh, our thoughts uh, looking at what happened, all the events that happened in preparation for that monumental time, the most important time for us as believers when Yeshua died and his blood was shed that gained liberty for us and eternal life. As we think about that time, um, I got to thinking about what happened in the in that room. I don't think it was the upper room, I don't know, it doesn't say. It says a few days before Passover, Yeshua washed the disciples' feet. And I felt God impressed on me to do that um, some weeks ago when I was speaking, that uh, that would be something we should do. And so after today, we're going to have an opportunity for your feet to be washed, which will put some of you into a panic. <laughs> It always does. It's the funniest thing. But I want to encourage you because uh, we're going to teach into it a little bit. We're going to talk about the whole meaning of it. And I want to assure you that there is an enormous potential for the presence of God to fall and for him to have opportunity by his spirit to do a new thing. So um, I thought I'd let you know. And um, I know that for some of us, we will need to go and prepare ourselves for that. Um, ladies, you know what I mean. Um, I would like you to leave your shoes and socks or whatever by your chair, and you will come to one or the, of five stations. There will be three ladies. We have many more single ladies than and uh, men, so there'll be one man and three ladies, and there will also be one station which will be empty, which um, husbands and wives can minister to each other at, okay? You're under no compunction to do it, no compulsion to do it. If you feel you really can't do that, it's not a problem. This is between you and God. But I want to say that, that I know that if you do come forward and have your feet washed, it will be a real blessing for you. So I uh, would really like to invite Michael to uh, to give us a little bit of teaching. We thought we might we might just be a little bit like Ken and Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> they minister together, don't they? <laughs> Not really. Um, Michael's going to give us some of the biblical background to um, to this whole subject. Right. Shabbat shalom. It's a pleasure to be with you. If the men who, um, who need to go and take their tights off and things, <laughs> wait until they want to move. When Shirley said we're going to, I'm going to teach on washing feet, I had the same dread as you have because I've got feet. I don't know whether. Um, no. No. Yeah. So I, it, it is something that's quite difficult, isn't it? Um, we've done it once before, and it's quite, uh, it's quite a difficult thing to have done. It's, it's okay to administer the washing of feet, and that's why we've got the elders doing this. But to actually receive washing of feet is quite difficult, isn't it? it? It is hard. But anyway, we hope that we'll encourage you to do that. Um, when we look at the biblical uh, precepts of washing and, and uh, ablution and, and those sort of things, cleansing, we see that there are different types and different uh, purposes, different symbolic purposes for, for washing. And, and, and there is a complete washing, there's hand washing, there's feet washing, etc. And, and, and uh, I'm just going to touch on some of them because we're only going to speak for about 20 minutes each and then we're going to... Uh, proceed with washing. So, um, so I'm going to be as quick as I can. Honouring a guest is one of the things that is really important in Jewish culture, and and the, the scriptures uh, make it very clear that we should honour one another. Amen. It, in right through the Tanakh, right through the, <coughs> the Gospels, we see that there is a real focus on honouring one another. 
And how do you do that? Well, you show respect, you show love, you, uh, you, you try and serve. And, um, and, he, and hospitality is one of those things that we do to honour one another. Honouring one another is a, is a really important thing within uh, the body of Yeshua, but also within Jewish culture. It's extremely important. It's something that God commands that we should do. And when we look at the scriptures, if we look at Genesis 18, 1 to 4, we see that Abraham is the first one that shows honour in this way. And uh, it says from verse 1, 18 verse 1, it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the entrance of the tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. And he said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under a tree. He sees three people coming past him and he wants to honor them. He wants to, to do what uh, God has told him to do and to be righteous. And when we've looked at righteousness previously, righteousness is about honoring people, loving, loving them and, and doing acts of loving kindness. That's what uh, it, this is all about. And God wants us to honor each other and act with human kindness towards each other, be hospitable and also to recognize strangers and recognize people and recognize that our fellow man in whatever circumstances <coughs> they're in. Genesis 19, one to two says, two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gateway of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you can rise early and go your way. way. They said, no, we will spend the night in the square. There's a washing that needs to take place when somebody comes into your house or into your, into your community. We don't invite uncleanliness into our community, do we? That's what we try and avoid. And uh, these two angels came in and the, the, they, Lot greeted them. And the first thing on his mind really was washing. It was this, this, this servant, and surely he's going to speak about servanthood and humility. But it's that servant act that came immediately to his mind. Genesis 24, 32 said, So the man came into the house and laid and unloaded the camels and gave him straw and fodder for the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Washing the feet again was something very important to the, to the, to the gift of hospitality that we all should have. Uh, honouring the guest, honouring those who come into your house. And, and, and you'll be surprised how many houses I go to when I'm not offered a cup of tea. It's oh. surprising. Or when, well, it's quite important. It's something that we should, we should all do as a natural thing. When somebody comes to our house, the first thing they get is tea and cake. And whatever we've got, in, and and if we if we're having a meal, and they stop, they join us for a meal, and that's that that is really important because hospitality and that welcoming of the guest brings a stronger relationship, doesn't it? it ha but but when you go into a house and you're not given the opportunity to receive a cup of tea, when you go from there, I tell you, you feel something different. How many of you <coughs> have felt that? You don't feel as if you've been invited, do you? Yeah. It's like, I visited somebody, I don't know them enough or well enough to sit down and have a cup of tea with them. And scripture makes it very clear that actually we should welcome people in and give them what we've got. Give them and serve them. That's the way relationship grows, isn't it? That's the way it happens for us. And relationships are, are deeper than a neighbour coming in and, and having a cup of tea with them. The, I think the strongest relationship, other than the one we should have with God, is between man and wife. 
It's a really important relationship. And, and I was pleased to read when I looked at the history of this and looked at rabbinic tradition that actually the wife washed the feet of her husband <laughs> before he ate. <laughs> and this was the service that was expected of the wife, it says, by one rabbi. It, it was one of the personal attentions to which her husband is entitled. <laughs> the Babylonian Talmud says, I wasn't sure I wanted to help Shirley with this message, but I tell you, when I found this, I loved it. The Babylonian Talmud says this, besides preparing his drink and bed, the wife ha must wash the hands and face of her husband. Oh. <laughs> it was customary to wash the feet before going to bed. And it was something that the wife could do as a service for her husband. Yeah. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. Isn't it lovely? It's even more lovely than tradition. <laughs> yeah, they, don't do, they don't do tradition in Rithi. <laughs> Intimacy in that way is absolutely lovely, isn't it? It's, it's absolutely wonderful, really. I, I, if you imagine that taking place, how beautiful is it? But how beautiful is it if you turn it around as well? And the husband does exactly the same for the wife. Or if you serve your wife. I'm actually, I'm actually uh, disturbed by some of the things that I hear about husbands who neglect the wives, who don't serve the wives. It's like, it, it, it doesn't fit, does it? it? It That doesn't sound right, does it? It also doesn't sound right the other way around. Serving one another in relationships are enacted out on a daily basis, aren't they? That's what they should be. That's how it should be. And some of us who have this gift of service actually love to do things for our wives and our husbands. <laughs> Even though they don't want it done. So <laughs> I, when Shirles is washing up, when Shirles is cooking, and I come alongside her to wash up, because I want to serve her, I want to just be there and do it. The pot that has got the sauce in, ready to go on the, on the meat, is already been poured down the sink and washed. <laughs> so it can be a problem. It's not always a good thing, is it? No. <laughs> So you can see, I'm used to getting shouted at. But in terms of, of sp in spiritual terms, washing is really important. It's, it's symbolic in regard to cleanliness before God. And, and, and for us as believers, we've been washed by the blood of the Lamb, haven't we? You know, our, our sin has been washed away and we're cleansed because of that. But let's look at some of the background to it. If we look at Exodus 30, 18, it says, You shall make a bronze basin. This is, this is an instruction regarding the uh, tabernacle. And God says, You shall make a bronze basin with a bronze stand for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. God is saying that there's something between the altar and the tent of meeting where the people meet which is there specifically for cleansing. Now, the truth of it is, if we haven't come to Yeshua and we haven't, been, if we haven't repented of our sin and received forgiveness for our sin, we have no right to go to the altar of God. I, sp I spoke about that in the last couple of weeks. We don't have a right because we're not clean to go into those places. We have to come to know Yeshua. We have to come into that place of repentance. For our sins to, to receive that cleanliness that only Yeshua can give us. And it's because we can meet together, we can be together, but if we don't actually repent of our sins, we're not able to get into that place of intimacy with God. We're not able to get there to a place where Shirley's going to speak about with Yeshua washing the feet of the, the disciples. And, and in this. Um, scripture 30, uh, Exodus 30, 19, it says, With the water, Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet. This is Aaron the high priest. The high priest in the temple, temple who followed Aaron, the sons and those appointed to be high priests in the temple, always bathed and washed before they ministered in the temple. Always 
uh, prepared themselves in the way that God asked them to prepare. And that's exactly how we should be when we come into a congregation. We should prepare ourselves, shouldn't we? Put things that we've done in the right place. Ask God to forgive us. That's why we have communion here. Ask God to forgive us and then enter into the presence of God. It's, it, it's, it's not right to bring sin into the house of the Lord. And I'm going to speak about that just for a minute. It's not right to bring uncleanliness into the house of God, is it? But, you know, we, it, because salvation and forgiveness is a free gift, you don't have to put money in a box outside the door before you come in. You just put it right with God. Is that right? It doesn't cost you anything, does it? You don't have to bargain with God. You just have to say, Father, would you forgive me? And in the same way, the priests wash and cleanse themselves. Cleansing from death. Isn't that really important for us? It's really, really important for us. And, and the scripture that speaks to me most about this is, is the red heifer in Numbers 19. <laughs> but let's just examine it very, very quickly. God says, take a heifer, three years old, that hasn't carried a yoke, that hasn't actually uh, worked on, uh, under burden, sacrifice it outside of the city gates. It's the only sacrifice that doesn't take place in the temple. Sacrifice it outside the city gates, and with the ashes, put that into the water of cleansing, so that the priest who has touched a dead body or touch death, can use that water to wash himself and cleanse himself. Now, that, were Yeshua was executed outside the city gates. That's where he was crucified. And he cleanses us from death. And it's a beautiful teaching. This whole thing is lovely. And read Numbers 19 if you haven't. It's just lovely. That, that, he fulfills everything, doesn't he? he? Now, the thing about the water with the ashes is accepted by Jewish scholars even at the time of Yeshua and he would have accepted it. The water and the ashes don't actually cleanse you from death, do they? It's not that that's cleansing you from death. It's obedience to keep that command. So the priest is obedient to keep the command and faithful and trusting that God will cleanse him from death. We're in the same position, guys. We come before Yeshua believing that only he can cleanse us from death. It's a trusting thing. It's a faith. It comes from us. It comes from our heart. And he does cleanse us. So if we are considered priests of the Lord, then that's what we do. We come before him trusting and, and in faith that he's going to cleanse us from death and give us eternal life. So this whole cleansing thing has a real connection to eternity for us. It's really important. And then in Leviticus 15, 11 to 12, it speaks about, um, about cleansing from discharges. And I'm not going to go into that in depth. But, but actually it's, it, it, it speaks to me symbolically of not passing on uncleanliness and and, and, and this is really important for, for us, and, and, and it was for me when I was working as a policeman, because you have to work in the world, but not be of the world. Yeah. And you, what you don't want is uncleanly practice or uncleanly things coming to, to overwhelm you or to contaminate you, do you? So, so in, in the police force, the language was terrible. I mean, my language was just appalling when I was, before I was saved. But the day I got saved, Dave's giving me instructions about I'm where to stand. Like yeah, it's terrible. But saved. once I was saved, God, it was like a washing came over me. And I stopped swearing, and everybody else used to say, why do you stop swearing? Why do you stop doing this and stop doing that? I'm not going to tell you what I was doing. But, <laughs> but, but I did. I stopped everything. But then I realized that actually I don't want to get involved in places where bad language is used. And today I'm offended by it. So if I'm watching a film, we have a real difficulty at home, don't we? If we're watching a film, 
and there's a lot of bad language in it. It's just offensive. We turn it off. Or, mm. You know, we, we watch some really boring stuff now, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't find exciting stuff where there's no bad language or sex, can you? You know. Sorry? The Macrony kids. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So it's, but we don't want to be contaminated by something that's sinful. Do you feel the same? The more you get closer to God, the less you want to be involved with people who are in sin. You know, you want to minister to them, you want to love them, you want to draw them into the kingdom, but actually you don't want to go out for a pint with them. Do you? That, you don't want to socialise with them so much. You want to draw them into the kingdom, but actually some of the things they do, you don't want to get tied up with. So, you know, the, and, and, and Leviticus 15 speaks of me of that, but I'm and cleansing from association is really important that we, we do that. I know that in the minute, I had ministry last week again. I stuffed that with Shirley and Becky. I don't know why I get the hardest two. Hey, there's no compassion in those two women. No at all. Oh, don't feel sorry for <laughs> You know, there's, 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 I couldn't hide anywhere. There was nowhere I could hide. I was hoping for somebody who's going to be easy, kind, and compassionate. But no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Is there anyone like that here? Or on the deliverance team? No. There isn't. So, um, and, and, and cleansing from association is, is really important to us. Uh, it, we have to deal with some of the things in the past, soul ties and some of those things that have really bound us up and the, the deliverance team deal with every day. Um, Psalm 25, 5 to 6 says, I hate the company of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocent, innocence and go around your altar, O Lord. It's like, you know, we've got to be in that place with God, because we've got the free gift of cleansing, we've got to, we've got to actually focus our lives on that and focus our our, our ways on a holy walk and a righteous walk and, and a walk with God. And then there's guarding against uncleanliness. Well, I looked at that in, from the point of view of the temple, and the temple's really interesting. Uh, there's certainly the second temple for us because that's the time Yeshua ministered them. And uh, at the time of the second temple, there were 24 <laughs> posts around the temple at which the Levites stood to keep uncleanliness out. And they, there was 24 teams of Levites at these 24 points around the temple. And then they had a temple guard who would go round and make sure that they didn't go to sleep. Because they were ministering through the night as well, and they did eight hour shifts. There were three watches, and they did eight hours each. And uh, uh, they stood and watched for eight hours. And one of the, the reasons they did that was because of this uncleanliness, and because the fort of Antonio was right next to the temple. And this was a, this was a fort that was built by Herod, and in that fort were 600 Roman soldiers living and guarding. And that's where the barracks were. That's where Paul talks about being in the barracks. It, it, he was right next to the temple. Now, can you imagine what responsibility it was for uh, uh, the, the Levites to keep the Romans out? Because they were Gentiles, weren't they? They weren't allowed to go in there. And they were men of sin. They, they, they weren't allowed in. So this was a really important job. If they had come into the temple, they would have brought with them uncleanliness. And, and the Levites, actually, after their duty and before their duty, would wash themselves. It was, it's such an important thing as, in, in terms of our spiritual life that we keep out the things that are not of God from our lives. We do our best to do that. You know, we've had people coming into the congregation who really are lovely people, um, uh, who want to support Israel, who want to keep the Sabbath, but are actually in sin, and we've had to ask them to leave. They've been living together, and, and, and Matt came across that with me some years ago, didn't you? Where, you know, where we had a couple here 
who, who did that. And then I was preaching a, a one message where I, I knew a Christian lady from the time that I was saved had come into the congregation. And uh, Dave's going like this now. Move over to see. Because we're doing the sound. It's not, I don't know why. Okay. And, uh, and she was there while I was preaching on adultery. And halfway through, she got up and walked out. And I thought she was married. I honestly thought she was married because I knew who, what I thought was her husband. But actually, she wasn't married. And she hadn't been married for 20 years but living with this man. So, you know, we have to kind of deal with those things in our congregation. And we have to, we have to serve the congregation by trying to keep uncleanliness out. And, and it's not just our duty and the elders' duty. It is your duty, actually. But it is everybody's duty to try and help people who are in sin move from that place into a place of holiness as far as we can go. And, and we want to do that. We, I'm not saying that we throw people out and say, you can't come back and don't ever see you again. We offer them help and we offer them support. But many of those who are in sin don't want support and help, do they? They you know that's the problem but but if we look at uh at what was happening in the second temple period actually there were these guards on the doors of the temple who were there specifically to make sure that the sanctuary was holy now we're a temple of the holy spirit aren't we that's what, what we are it's our own job to try and keep our hearts and our souls and our minds as clean as possible before God. It's, it's our duty, really, to try and do that, to try and deal with some of the things that are not right with God, that we think, oh, they're not really sin because they're not in the Ten Commandments. They're not there because, you know, well, I'm not committing adultery. I haven't murdered anyone this week. I, 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 you know, I, I haven't stole anything. Uh, you know, I, I, I gave the neighbour a lift down to the shops and, and you think it's, everything's great. But actually in the house, your language is bad, your behaviour is bad, you're, you're not serving one another, you're not preferring one another, you're not spending time with... That's strange for me to be preaching this. <laughs> you can see that 20 years of haranguing by Shirley and David's But... but you know, if we're not doing that in our homes, then there's a problem. Just deal with it. Just let's just deal with it. And also in the congregation, I'm finishing now. Sure. In the congregation, you know, I, I I know we have a lot of respect from you. We we're shown a lot of respect, and we really love that, and are, 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 are blessed by that. But I tell you, we. All the elders and ourselves want to, want to show our honour and respect to you guys. Because without your love and your support, we can't minister in the way that we minister. And neither can we actually affect anything without your love and support. We can't do that. So, so I, I, I don't know what Shirley's going to say, but for me, it's an honouring of you and all that... You, you are to us, that you are family, you are close to us, you are, we, we prefer you often above ourselves in many ways because you're part of a family, you're, you know, you're in it with us, you're, you're, you're part of, our father is there and we're all brothers and sisters and you know what you feel like about your brothers and sisters, you know, you, you love them, don't you? If something happens to your brother or sister, it's a problem. Isn't it? And, and, and Al's faced with that now. You know, it's about loving, preferring one another, spending time with each other, and just honouring each other. So, thank you, Shirley. It's over to you. I hope you speak as nicely to, about me than I <laughs> What do you think I should do? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, watch me face. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to get off that stool. <laughs> it's really uncomfortable. So coming to um, we're gonna be in John, John the John chapter thirteen. Yeshua came out of that tradition. Yeshua had lived 
with that teaching. He understood what a mikvah was, a bathing pool. He understood the, ne the necessity for cleansing. And so did his disciples. Don't forget, they were all Jewish. They were all um, of Jewish descent, brought up as good, God-fearing um, Jewish children. And, uh, and, and they, were, they were in that place of understanding the law in regard to cleansing. And so we, we have this situation where Yeshua knows what's going to happen to him. He knows where he's going. He knows what is, is, is going to occur. And he, he chooses a, a, the most ordinary time to make a huge point uh, for us as believers. Uh, he, he chooses a time when they're eating <coughs> together, they have a meal together. And um, it, there's not much information given about it, but it is, it is we are told in, in John 17, in John 13, um, that it was a meal that were uh, taking place prior to uh, the, the, the Passover. So they've gathered together, John 13. It was just before the Passover feast. Yeshua knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Yeshua. He knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took up his off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Yeshua replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Yeshua answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Yeshua answered, a person who has a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. One of the things I love about Yeshua is that he just had a way of turning things upside down. He would go into a situation and, uh, and, uh, and what was expected of him was not what they got. What people thought he was going to do, was, was it, it never worked out that way, did it? And how the, the disciples never knew where they were with him. Do you remember when um, the, 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 the father with the epileptic son, um, they, they just couldn't cast that demon out. And he gave him down the banks, didn't he? <laughs> oh, but how long have I got to put up with you? you know, he was cross with them because obviously they missed it. He called them so dull. In the, boat, in the boat because they just couldn't get what it was he was saying. And then they would, go, they would think they were going to go to the temple and it was all going to be really nice because what do you do at temples? You worship and you praise. And what does he do? He upturns the tables of the cellars and, and creates absolute havoc. Yeshua was one who, who really turned things upside down. And I'm sure that his disciples were embarrassed at times, really discomforted. I mean, you know... 
wow, you can imagine they would be in out, really outside their comfort zone because they'd identified themselves with him. And so they had to take the flack as well. And you know, only a few hours before this word, this chapter here, it's actually recorded in Luke. They were arguing amongst themselves about who was the greatest. The disciples were having a moment of you know, self-exaltation. And uh, no, sorry mate, I'm better than you. I'm going to be there, I'm going to be first. Actually, when it comes to greatness, I've got the lot. <laughs> And it, that was only a few hours before. And so I, I think they probably, because they were following Yeshua, they were having a great time. They were seeing demons flee and people healed. They were seeing thousands following them. You know, they thought they got it made. And then Yeshua turns it all upside down again. He upends them and makes them realize that actually, if they want to be great, they have to be the lowest of the low. And one of the hardest things that we battle with in our Christian life, if we're in the world, if we don't know God, then actually it's never a battle. We think we're right. We act as though we're right. We behave as that we believe we're right and everybody else is wrong. That's how I felt. You know, I thought I got it. I, I was okay. I knew that there were one or two things that I wasn't quite sure of, but I still acted as though I was absolutely right. But when we're, in the, when we're in Christ, when we've come to Yeshua, when we've, when we've given him a right to expose our hearts, then suddenly we realize that self is a major issue. Self gets in the way of everything, doesn't it? It puffs us up in our own importance. It blocks our heart responses to God. Those responses that God, when God calls upon us to show compassion, or as Michael said, even just a, a, a hospitality, a cup of tea, mercy, generosity, acts of service, self gets in the way of all of those. And we, we, if we look through the scriptures, we can see that Yeshua had to address this many times with his disciples. Now, I always thought that the washing of feet was take, took place by the servant. Did you? If you read um, you know, commentaries and, and comments here and there, it's always the lowest of the low did that servant's job. And so we see in that context, Yeshua brings himself down to the lowest point in order to do the lowest job. But actually, from what Michael has said, that's not the case at all. There, in Jewish tradition, it's often the master of the house who washes the feet of the guest, like uh, just as an act of service, an act of, of, of putting everybody on the same level. You know, it, it's not like, oh, well, you know, uh, Ruth's come to our house and so we'll get the servant. Mike to wash your feet. <laughs> it's it's not it's not like that. It's it's an honour to do it. It's something that the master of the house does. It's a loving thing. It's not he gets somebody else to do it. So, but it but it is in in your in the commentaries in the Christian yeah. commentaries turned on its head a little bit. Mm -hmm. So what we see is Yeshua as the master of that event. He, uh, it doesn't say that where it was, where it took place. Some commentaries say it was in the upper room, but actually the scripture doesn't say that it was in the upper room. They were having a meal together, and obviously there was there was nobody there to do the job. And this is why he says he showed them the full extent of his love, having loved his own who were in the world. He now showed them the full extent of his love, which is an amazing scripture. I love. I love to read that. It's such a, a huge thing to comprehend that Yeshua um, would give the fullest extent of his love to each one of us. <clears throat> you see, he knew exactly who he was. By this time, he had no doubts as to his future 
as to what his calling was, what his purpose was, what the plan was. He knew exactly what was going on. There was no um, double-mindedness. He had set his face towards the cross, and he was going to go there. But he knew that, as it says in verse 3, that the Father had placed all things under his power, and that he had come from God, and that he was returning to God. What a place to minister to, to those disciples from. So from the very highest position that anyone could attain, Yeshua chooses to take the lowest position that anyone can attain. Washing feet. I mean, a lot of people have phobias about their feet. They actually can't stand their feet. They really, they don't show them. They don't want anybody to see them. And they certainly would not anybody, allow anybody to touch them. Maybe there's one or two here like that. It's quite common. So to wash feet is, I have to keep going. <laughs> when we wash feet, we're doing something which is actually very intimate, very intimate. And he chose to do that job which no one else was there to do. Now, you know that when you recline at table, that we see the pictures and we understand that there weren't seats like you're sitting on there. That at when they ate a meal, they reclined at table, so their feet were much nearer the next person's face than they would be in our culture. So it was actually quite important, having walked through the streets of Jerusalem, and you can imagine what was on the floor, it was quite important that feet were washed, wasn't it? So it was, it was an, a real act of love to do that. Simon Peter was one of those who couldn't cope. He could not cope with the Son of God. Remember? Who, are, who do you say I am? You are Yeshua, the Son of God. He knew exactly who Yeshua was. He couldn't cope with God, the Son of God, washing his filthy feet. And what did he say? No, you shall never wash my feet. But what Peter didn't realize, as, he, as Yeshua said to him, you will understand later, that actually this was more symbolic. It was more than washing his dirty feet. It was a sign and a symbol of what needed to happen to all believers everywhere, you and me included. The symbolic washing with water and with blood that our sins could be taken away. And you know, Peter was, we know that he was impulsive, he was a feisty kind of person. He was very outspoken, wasn't he, and headstrong. But I believe that at that moment he had a revelation of his entire filth before God, as indeed all of us have had. I, as in, I hope all of us have had. He realized that he was actually in need of cleansing all over, inside and out. And so he asks Yeshua to clean his hands and his head as well. He wanted a mikvah, didn't he? He wanted a full uh, immersion bath so that he could feel clean. I don't know what it's like to look into the eyes of Yeshua face to face like that, but I imagine that he saw something in Yeshua's eyes that said to him, you are unclean. So this act tells us that there's more to understand about Yeshua, more to understand than in the act itself. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. And because we understand that we have been washed, from head to toe in the blood, and that living waters are within us, the living waters of the Spirit. We know that 
it, this, is, this lesson is not so much about the physical act of washing feet. It's about the heart. He says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Well, what did he do for them? What did he do for us? He became humble. He humbled himself. He, the rabbi and the teacher, the one who is to be, you know, revered and, um, and, and taken care of and looked after, looked up to, he was the one who humbled himself before men and knelt before them and handled their filthy feet. And no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So if it's okay for me to do this for you, it's okay for you, and indeed blessed if you do this one for another. And I got to wondering what each disciple was thinking as Yeshua took hold of their feet. What, what would it have felt like for them? Twelve disciples, 24 feet. Dirty feet. A symbol of that which was inside them, a symbol of sin, and how uncomfortable they would have felt, how discomforted, how, if I could only get out of here, they would have felt. Put yourself in their position. Some of you may already be feeling that discomfort, thinking, the one in the highest authority in the universe is taking the lowest of low tasks for me, serving me. For some of us, this exercise will be one of coming down from a lofty place to a place of humiliation. For some of us, it will be needing to take ourselves from the back benches, from the place of hiddenness, in, in what's the word? Inconspicuous, see? <laughs> <laughs> Not being obvious, always being at the back, coming into the front and allowing ourselves to be served instead of serving. And if we do that, we obey the command that God has given us to serve one another, to love one another. You know that there are 19 um, exhortations in the scriptures that Yeshua, Paul, the gospel writers have given us as believers that we should do for each other. And that most people say the first one is to wash one another's feet. Well, now we understand what that is, being humble, serving one another. Love one another, build one another up, accept one another, admonish one another, greet one another, serve one another, bear one another's burdens, show forbearance to one another, Forgive one another, be subject to one another, comfort one another, encourage one another, stimulate one another to love and to good deeds, confess our sins to one another, pray for one another, be hospitable to one another, and be clothed with humility towards one another. And these are specific obligations that the New Testament teaches us. The New Testament scriptures say this is how you should behave. And so I want, I want to ask you if you would consider what it means to, to allow your feet to be washed.
For each of us, it's probably a different 